Got it. Uh, welcome everyone um, to our first webinar for the year, uh, Vic Notel in partnership with Nutrisoil. We're proud to bring you our worm casting webinar. Uh, we're focusing on vermiculture, Johnson Sioux and chelating nutrients. Uh, we want to welcome our own resident worm farmer to Carla Matic to the uh, worm casting, uh, as well as Beck Hammersley uh, from Prospect in WA and Cam Banks, a dairy farmer from Mount Gambria in SA. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping this morning, uh, just make sure everyone's microphones are off. Um, we will be having a Q&A session at the end, so, uh, but because of our strict time schedule, we want all the present presentations to go for about 15 minutes each, um, and we'll have a Q&A session for 15 minutes at the end. So if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the, in the Q&A box down the bottom there, and we'll, we'll run through the Q&A session at the end. So. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Nicola for her presentation. Thanks, Dan. Have I got my screen up, Amy? Uh, no. no. Oh. You just have to share screen. Oh, me? Yep, down the bottom. Okay. I see. Okay. There we go. So then you've just got to select which screen you'd like to share. There we go. And then you can make that perfect. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So thank you, Dan, for the introduction and for having us today. Um, I think farmers are increasingly using some type of biology uh, with their nutrients. And the reason for that is that um, biostimulant with nutrients, you can increase the immunity. Um, I'm just going to start my clock, actually, because we've only got 15 minutes each, and I'll keep talking. Um, increase your immunity while you're actually delivering nutrients. Um, you can increase the amounts of microbes in your soil and on your plant and in your plant. Um, but also you can provide amino acids directly to the plant. Um, the nutrients that you give your plant are actually um, going to be converted to amino acids anyway. That's what your plant uses. Uh, and you're also, um, you know, if it has the fulvic substances in it, it can assist with the nutrient delivery. The microbes and the nutrient go into the leaf of your plant um, uh, more efficiently because it opens a stomata on the plant. So it's really becoming um, a, a um, common way, uh, I guess, to increase your soil health but also grow really good profitable crops is to use the nutrient and the biology together. So I'm going to talk about... Um, the worm biology. I think there's two really amazing things about the worm biology. Um, the first one is that worms excrete this um, fluid and, and mucus, and then they excrete castings. And the castings are quite well known, but the fluid mucus is a little bit um, not thought of, but it's really important. So uh, with the castings, they consume um, soil, and um, in that soil, there's microbes in there. So they can cull the pathogenic microbes and excrete the, um, the, excrete the beneficial microbes. Sometimes they can excrete them by a thousandfold. They don't excrete all of the pathogenic ones, but they, uh, um, they don't cull all of the pathogenic ones, but they um, release it in the right balance. So your pathogenic microbes are actually nutrient cycling microbes until they get that monopoly. So um, it's about balance and diversity when it comes to biology. Uh, the worm excretion or mucus, uh, when you think about a worm and how they breathe, they actually breathe outside of themselves. So they, um, they go under the saddle of another worm. It takes two worms to breathe, but they are both male and female, one worm. Um, and when they move around together, they actually excrete all of these hormones and enzymes and antimicrobials, um, antiviruses, um, just like when you're having a natural birth, a mother does that for a child. So um, when, you know, there's lots of literature that shows that a natural birth protects the child from um, disease and pathogens and builds its immunity, very similar with a worm. So really what that worm's doing is it's um, releasing all of these microbes that protect their, their babies. 
um, from pests and diseases and pathogens and build the immunity. But it builds the immunity of the soil at the same time. So you've basically got lots of birth canals um, in, in the soil when the worm's moving through it, full of castings and all of these antibiotics and antivirals and signaling um, metabolites. So the worms make a complex compost tea that I guess no human has yet been able to replicate. And I'm going to take you through some DNA testing and some plate testing and, and really show in science um, that where that is the case, that microbes in a worm are in the right balance and they're in abundance and diversity is, re is really the key. And out of all of the micro, out of all the biostimulants, worms have the most diversity. Uh, there's lots of uh, literature on our website about disease suppression, um, things using a worm liquid or using a vermicast assists with um, rust, rhizoctonia, root rot, mites, increases photosynthesis, drought resilience on, on all different plants. So wheat, rice, vegetables, sugar cane, um, there's, there's lots of literature that this works. So there's three types of different worm products you can think of. There's worm castings, then there's the worm liquid or vermiwash. Uh, we make the castings and the vermiwash at Nutrisoil. And then there's the worm casting extract. So it can get confusing, but basically the worm casting extract is um, castings put into water, bubbled up for a couple of hours, and the water goes brown. So then you've got um, the microbes have been blown off and also the... Uh, the um, all the metabolites are in that water. Uh, then at Nutrisoil, what we make is this vermi wash. So you can see there's um, rows of composting worms there. Uh, we feed them a really diverse diet. Uh, so we get more diversity of microbes in the system. And then we mist that system. So you'll find, you'll see that that misting is really important. It's that slow misting and dripping, and it's kind of what happens um, you know, in the soil when worms bring up castings and then the rainfall um, seeps through those castings and takes it back through the soil again, putting that vermi wash through the soil. Um, you can see that we use sheep to graze on the worm beds. We are an allowable input, so we can't use any chemicals on those worm beds. Um, they, um, worms can use... They, they can break down chemicals, you'll see that, but they can't have a whole heap of chemicals because basically they'll die. Um, and now I'm going to go into the diversity. So first of all, I'm going to go into the diversity in a worm um, extract, Nutrisoil and castings, just to show you um, the diversity and then I'll go more into the actual microbe function after that. Uh, I'm going to talk about bacteria diversity first. Um, a worm liquid is probably known as being bacterial dominant and people worry about that. They worry about bacterial dominant soils. But what you'll see is the bacteria have amazing functions. Um, so there's, there's lots of reasons you do want bacteria in your soil, but of course you want a, um, a balance and you'll see that, there, that there's different ways to achieve that. So this is Nutrisol as we make it. So DNA testing, you just, you're looking at diversity here. Um, there's actually a lot more microbes that come out of the DNA testing, uh, but anything that's kind of um, under 1% isn't reproducing. So these are the active microbes in Nutrisol um, that are reproducing. This is the worm castings. Now it does look deceiving because it looks like it's not diverse, but going back to what I said is it's the most complex of all of the biostimulants. 48% is actually totally unknown. So we can get it down to the phyla. So you've got different ranks. So from kingdom down to species um, when you're doing DNA testing. So phyla's up on the higher ranks. So um, we could say that someone is from the Animalia Kingdom, but we can't say if they're a worm or if they're a person, a human. So um, there's lots we don't know, uh, and that's, that's the key to these uh, worm castings. And then this is the diversity of the worm cast extract. So 70 kilos of worm castings put into 1,000 litres, and you can see the diversity just is, is not as... Um, 
uh, as intense. There's not as much diversity in extract or, or amounts of microbes, but still really interesting, different. Um, so there's a real synergy of using these things together. This is in a document, so I'm, I'm going to um, send this out, or well, Amy will send it out. So um, it, it's not great for a PowerPoint, but this is just the easiest way for me to show you these. So we've compared Nutrisol liquid as we've made it, worm castings um, and extract, and we've um, actually been able to um, do some DNA testing on some biofets, which uh, Callum Lawson, I know you're on here, Callum, so thanks for providing those. Um, he made, and he made them from soil land food um, recipes, I think David Hardwick's course. So what you'll see here is there's different microbes in all of these and they do different functions. And then you'll see what happens when we actually add them all together. So the liquid, the Nutrisol liquid is the highest in bacteria and archaea. Um, and archaea are really ancient microbes, they're important for resilience. Uh, the worm castings is not as high in species of bacteria, but like fungi off the chart, 220 species of fungi. Uh, the extract, again, species are, are good, but not as high as, as what we make. And just because of that unique um, dripping function and recycling back over um, and the diversity of food, you know, all of those things add to these species that you can get in a worm liquid. And then the biofert, you can see less bacteria. It's quite acidic condition, so you're going to get um, microbes that, are, that live in these acidic conditions, but you do get these yeasts, which are really um, beneficial. And then um, the CAV, you're actually chasing these lac lactobacillus, which is great for disease suppression, and you'll see Cam talk about um, using them in chelating as well. So that's what's in these bioferts. So... Um, We'll start talking about the functions quite quickly. Um, in the Nutrisol, looking, you know, Pseudomonas, we know that Pseudomonas are, are in a worm liquid. They're great for frost protection. Um, they provide antibiotics, uh, multiple metabolites. They help cellulose P, assist with plant salinity, um, frost resilience. There's microbes that transfer sulfur to the plant and, again, all these plant hormones which are coming off like that mucus of, of the worm. Um, looking at the extract, you can see look different um, because of the way we've treated it. So all, all from the different same source, like the Nutrisol, the worm casting the extract, but because the extract's been bubbled up and it, it's had more aeration, um, diversity has decreased, and what's coming out is these um, microbes that um, biodegrade chemicals and they produce antimicrobials and protecting plants from pathogens. Um, the yeasts are really good for degrading organic matter in the biofets, and the lactobacillus. Um, really good for disease protection. They like a probiotic. Um, they weaken the cell walls of other microbes and, and they debil debilitate pathogens. Uh, so it, it just continues down um, through the line. You'll see in Nutrisol, you've also got things that break down contaminants. So we know that we can use some chemicals um, and that the microbes can break that down. So it's not going into the waterways as much. It's not in our food as much. Um, and then you've got, um, again, the castings extract. Um, there's some, it could have mild pathogens in it. Um, but again, it's, it's about diversity. Uh, and then you've got your pseudomonas in there. So producing antibiotics, your biofit. Don't drink them. There's uh, microbes in there that are fatal to humans, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, sometimes our cattle do drink the worm liquid. It gets into their um, troughs, but it can be a probiotic as well. Uh, and then um, it just continues. Well, I guess what I'm trying to show you is that, that these worm products have just so many functions and <clears throat> all of the different um, ways that you put those microbes into. So whether they're in the solid form, the solid form's always going to have more fungi. As soon as it goes into the water, you reduce the fungi. Um, it would be the same as any, any compost or any, um, any uh, David Johnson's Sioux. 
um, it, it's just going into that liquid, you reduce the fungi. It's not its conditions for fungi. Um, but it's broad acre, much more easier. So you can get it onto a seed. You can get it into the leaf of the plant. Um, that rhizophagy um, a process is really important because you're getting microbes into the plant, which then used by the plant and then excreted in, in, with, into the soil via these root hairs and, and starting that whole process of the, the signalling between the plant and, and the microbes. <laughs> so again, you'll see that the diversity of, of the worm liquid on the side keeps going, nitrogen fixing, um, all types of things and more. Um, again, produces gibberellic acid. Um, so there's lots of things that um, you're buying in a bottle that the worm's already making. This goes into the fungi now. Um, I won't talk about the fungi too much. We know that um, fungi are really important. Um, and again, the castings like off the chart for fungi, 220 species, if you can keep them in their solid form. But the liquid, we've got lots of evidence shows that it actually increases fungi in the soil. Um, and then there's yeasts, which are really cool. Like they're not as ad ad advanced as um, a fungi. Um, but they're really good for disease protection um, and weakening the cell walls of pathogens um, and assisting with decomposition as well. Uh, so, again, the fungi keeps going with the worm castings. Uh, this is the David Johnson Sioux, which Beck's just about to talk about. Um, Terry McCoster sent this testing away to Emma Labs. These David Johnson Sioux are at different stages, so different um, months of maturity. Um, we hear about a worm liquid, again, being back highly bacterial, um, but what you'll see here is very similar to a David Johnson Sioux once it gets to that uh, liquid form. Um, and you can see uh, Nutrisoil is, the diversity is higher of microbes. Um, the amount of unknown, because it's coming from a worm, that complexity of the worm, 42% they don't know in this particular DNA testing. Um, bacteria, very similar with David Johnson's Sioux and Nutrisoil as are the eukaryotes, so your more complex microbes like fungi. Um, and the archaea, so... Um, Again, complementary, but very similar. So now I'm, I'm finishing up now and I'm just going to show you, okay, so we know the DNA testing, but it doesn't show us the abundance as much. What happens um, when um, we culture these? And then what happens when we put them all together? So what, what's the amounts in them? So with the cabs of the lactobacillus, um, 104 million colony forming units, um, no fungi arrived in that one. Um, and then we have the BioFert, 178 um, million yep, um, colony forming units of bacteria, no fungi. Um, and now we've mixed together the BioFert, five litres of nutrients on the worm casting extract. So we're putting that synergy of everything together. We've got 410 uh, million colony forming units of bacteria and 150 of the fungi. So bringing all those things together is, is where you can get that diversity. So um, the worm base is the most diverse, but I really love mixing these things together because you can get that um, complexity even higher. And then I'll leave you with something remarkable is the worm castings, uh, 2 billion colony forming units of bacteria. And I can't see, I'll hide that, and 300,000 colony forming units of fungi. So um, I'm going to hand you over to Beck now. Okay, good morning. I'm just going to put my timer on because I am a chatter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so because we are aiming for um, that really biodiverse um, suite of things that we can add to our soil to really grow soil. That's why we've started adding the Johnson Sews into, into the program. So a quick bit of the why. Um, we're increasing the soil carbon sequestration and anyone that knows anything about West Australian soils, we've got ancient soils, low fertility, 
Um, and if they get too dry, they end up um, hydrophobic as well. So we're finding with um, increasing those uh, soil organic carbon levels, um, we we improve that water holding capacity and we um, limit that um, hydrophobia um, that causes such problem with lots and lots of soils in WA. I'm not sure about your neck of the woods over there, but um, it's a massive problem. Um, we're also, it's increasing crop yield and you can see that through um, Dr. J David Johnson's ongoing um, scientific research around that, but we're seeing that anecdotally here. Um, we, we're seeing that it's increasing that nutrient availability, the water retention, um, and I think I can skip through the rest of that. Oh, it's a low salinity and in WA we have um, a massive salt lake system um, and encroaching salinity issues in a lot of the wheat belt areas. So to be able to watch those salt areas um, be slowly reduced in size um, is, is very exciting to see. Okay, we can flick that over. Do you want me to hit the little button? I don't know. Um, I can wave. All right, here's a quick um, picture just in case if you want to build yours. Um, to get started, we have holes in the bottom that line up with the chimneys um, and I strongly suggest um, fastening them down. If anyone wants more information about how we build them so that they can be used year on year, uh, it's probably easier to, to flick me a text or something rather than go through it all now. <laughs> all right, we'll flick through. Thanks, Nicola. Okay, so um, making our mix, this is the really important part. We're using um, our sheep manure. We're making sure that when we scrape it up from under the shed, uh, we're not getting any sand in it. Uh, we know that those sheep are very, very healthy. Um, Diane and haven't had to drench for 20 odd years. Um, because the, the diversity of the pastures um, and the self-selection that the sheep can do naturally um, helps them to keep a really healthy gut microbiome. Um, so, so what we've got is a raw product that is, is very, very healthy. It's already coming out of the gut of an incredibly healthy um, sheep. So the microbiome uh, is you know, sitting in that manure ready to go. So it's fantastic. Um, and our own homegrown multi-species hay, which is grown no chemical, um, as diverse as possible, including um, native species that end up in there, like our mulla mulla uh, salt bush um, and some of our, our native grasses end up in that hay as well. Um, we put through a cattle mixer and then we add uh, watered up to 70%. So if you grab a handful and squeeze it as hard as you can, you might get one or two uh, drops of water come out, um, but it's it's damp, definitely not wet. Um, just quick picks of filling it. We do fill over and within days it's down below the top of that IBC frame. Yep. Um, as you can see, uh, we it's a two-person job, especially because I'm short, to pull out those chimneys after a few days. And there's a few shots down those holes. You can see that they're holding really well, which is important. That's, that's all about getting the air in the system so it remains an aerobic system. Um, and you can see that there's, there's that fungi forming just after um, uh, less than a week um, that's forming on the insides of those. Um, and then making that extract, we've, um, we've got custom-made custom, custom -made extract tanks that are actually, um, they look fairly simple there, but they've got a 30 degree uh, gradient in the bottom to help with cleaning and things. The stainless steel um, stirrer in the middle. I've taken that photo through water just the other day. So, um, it's there's 20,000 litres between us and that spinny thingy, um, the rotor there. So, um, and that other slide there, that little um, is clump is uh, some Johnson Sioux that I've just squeezed in my hand. 
zero water came out it's holding together i reckon you could get a fingerprint off that that's how uh, the consistency that we're aiming for and that will dissolve and break up in the water beautifully uh, make a fantastic extract okay in turn um we we've been doing some testing just on farm um testing the quality we, we can do a qualitative testing under the microscope so di rachel and i have all, all done um a course uh where we can look at that uh what we're not we're not looking at the quantity of things what we're looking at is, uh quality so basically we're identifying um the biodiversity um within that sample of our microbes uh, and fungi uh, we're using it as a seed dressing um, as a compost extract we're using around two mature ibcs in 7,000 litres of water so quite a strong brew um, and that's applied to the seed immediately prior to seeding um, it also goes out um, as a one of the uh, ingredients in our foliar sprays which are going out at the moment um, so the compost uh, that we buy in at the moment, we're still working on building large quantities of compost um, and the Johnson Sue's into 20,000 litres and they are applied during uh, crop growth via the broom, boom spray. So the kiddos are working on that at the moment. Um, I will, what have I got? Seven and a half minutes. Um, the, the studies that are coming out that Dr um, David Johnson had, is doing on those um, Johnson Sue's at his end of the world look like they're replicated um, across the world. Um, it's the it's the diversity that we're aiming for, and something that I've found really really interesting just watching um, how our crop is setting itself up in comparison to the conventional farmers close by is that our our crops um, with their, their biological um, support, they're, they're putting out a root system that is far, far bigger than the um, initial leaf growth, um, which is setting them up really, really well. Um, I was explaining before we had five hot weeks after our first rain event this year. Um, so our cover crops had germination off a very small rain event after 18 months of incredibly dry conditions. Um, and those, those uh, seeds, because they had set themselves up so well, um, most of the, the uh, grains made it through that five weeks. And we're talking like plus 30 um, degrees for, for a lot of those five weeks. Um, they held on to that next rain event and now they're powering away. So that's fantastic. They're setting up everything with that biological system that they need to be really resilient. Um, I was thinking, Michaela, that I might just have a quick chat about this um, fungal ratio. Um, as we, as we set up, what we're finding in our system here is that our summer native grasses uh, are coming back uh, into the system um, because that seed bank has been there and the biology is starting to trigger or has been for several years um, trigger that seed bank that's just standing um, you know standing by in the soil um, so what we're discovering is that as our soil organic carbon um, or soil organic matter increases and the biology um, is sustaining that, we're getting growth of uh, native grasses that are very palatable um, that haven't been seen in this year for 50, 60 years. Uh, we've had to get them identified um, because no one recognised what they were. Um, so it's just something really exciting that we've um, been keeping our eye out for. Every season we see something new that hasn't been seen in the area for you know a considerable amount of time under intensive grazing so you know combination of of resetting that soil and and doing um really mindful grazing of the sheep 
uh, we're seeing a lot of diversity coming back in, in nature as well. Yep, we can flick that over. Um, paddock observations. Um, I found this one to be really interesting. Um, on the um, side there, you can see some little mushrooms popping through in some rows. Those, those furrows are actually from the previous year. They haven't been sown this year. Wouldn't have been able to get onto that paddock, I don't think. It's pretty soggy down there now. Um, but what we've noticed is that we're getting growth in high saline um, area just directly over the fence. That, that second photo um, is what the paddock on the other side without the biology looks like. That's, um, that's the neighbour's place. I'm sure he won't mind. Um, it just gives you an idea of the power of the diversity of these, these um, biologicals that we're all, all looking at. Um, that to me was astounding. I didn't eat them. I just let them do their thing. Okay, we can... Um, so I was saying the native grasses, um, we're getting lots of uh, fungi on the sheep manure. It's breaking it down really, really quickly. Um, we're, when we're doing soil tests using the microbiometer testing, we're seeing an increased biodiversity of um, soil biology and, and shifting those fungal bacterial ratios in the soil. Um, increased rhizos, uh I can't even say it now. It's, it's early in the morning here, Nicola. Um, yeah, that increased um, rhizophia uh, development. Uh, we get very excited. We're always out with a shovel um, having a look at, to see what's going on. Um, and the number of fruiting bodies and uh, of fungi fruiting bodies and the diversity of those has been absolutely astounding this season. Um, I have just made up a slide for Di to take away for her next adventure. Um, and every every day it's it's like, can we add another one? Because we've found something new and completely different. So we're finding that really exciting um, that we've got, you know, just that diversity that we can just see on the surface without having to, to get into the uh, microscopic side of things. Okay, yep. I must be getting... Oh, look at that. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Cam. Right, right on. Th thank you, Beck. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All, all good. Right on. Good morning, all. Questions at the end, please. Next slide, please. Right. I just would like to remind people of the three free things we get that do 95% of the plant growth light, water, and carbon dioxide. So the solar energy, um, the most, <coughs> David Johnson has identified the, the highest growth plants come uh, seaweed un under the water. They don't get full light. We often say in this part of the world at Mount Gambia, we're not getting enough light. We've got grey days. We see a lot of grey weather. The uh, seaweed is uh, underwater all the time. It doesn't get full sunlight either. So... Solar energy, uh, the carbon dioxide coming up from this biology in the soil and the water. Next slide. Oh, go back a couple. Go back. Uh, no, forward. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Uh, the the uh, process we use in our farming system both for our parches and our crops is, uh, and the question I'm just saying as a lead in with photosynthesis, photosynthesis is the key to our uh, whole process using the natural systems to harness those three major things that do 95% of our plant growth. So how do we go about getting healthy biology? Our first thing we do, because we are using a natural intelligence farming system, same as uh, similar sort of thing to what uh, Beck has just been talking of. First off, whenever we plant seeds, we inoculate the seed. Um, on the seed inoculation, we have nutrisoil. Um, <clears throat> we have um, 
also Johnson Sioux on there, and we put some actual na native micro microbes from our local soils. We also ensure we don't put any poisons on the seed, so we don't have any fungicidal treatments on the seed. Even the legume, we buy bare legume seed um, so that we um, don't have any um, <clears throat> uh, poisons or, you know, upsetting the soil biology. This is a photo that I took. I inoculated all the seed, mixed the seed, inoculated the seed. The plant on the left, this is uh, 23 days post planting from a May plant in uh, 2021. The seeds on the left only had the biostimulants of biology um, on the seed and in the furrow. Plants on the right had exactly the same treatment, but we added some manganese, cobalt, boron, and 75 kilos of guano down the tube with the seed. And you can see the difference in plant root growth. It's made a hell of a difference. That continued right through till our first um, uh, first grazing, which was at, at about nine weeks. Um, that difference the crop that only had the bio biologicals was a larger crop. Uh, I did. I took further photos at forty six days, and the same effect was still still noticeable. The the minerals was were growing out of it, but it wasn't. Um, it was still noticeable. So in our liquid inject, we put into the seed. Um, <clears throat> with the seed, we put. Um, all the biostimulants, nutrisoil, worm juice, high quality compost extract um, or <clears throat> is the main basis to it, Johnson Sioux, uh, K and F extracts, etc., and humates. We also this year put some silica with Maxil with the with the seed. <clears throat> um, so so that basically is showing the nutrients of feeding. So once we get the plants out of the ground, as they were in the last slide, we then start <clears throat> testing and checking what's going on. So our aim with testing with SAP tests, the SAP is like doing blood tests of a person. Um, tissue tests are similar to doing biopsies. SAP tests is like doing blood tests. And doing a SAP test gives you a look at exactly what's happening now, whereas a, a tissue test will show you a little bit of history in terms of the growth of that plant. So with our SAP testing, that will also give a bit of a glimpse as to what's going to happen in future, future weeks or future days. Um, <clears throat> we find this an incredibly valuable tool to help um, Help, help the bio, biology in the soil, help try to maximize photosynthesis. So you can see, uh, we'll go to the next slide. These are the times we, we try to do them pre tillering, pre stem elongation, flag leaf emergence, pre flowering. And we use foliar sprays with nutrients determined by those SAP tests what we need. So just briefly, we'll look at nutrient roles in the plant. So for maximum photosynthesis, we need nitrogen, of course, magnesium, phosphorus is a carrier, iron and manganese. In this, the soils where we have these calcium or soil over the top of calcium limestone in this part of the world. Uh, the pH is very high at 7.9 uh, because of in the irrigation country, because of the uh, irrigation water is 7.9. Uh, we have a lot of trouble getting manganese availability. We've put a lot of manganese solid fertilizer on over the years with very little effect. It wasn't until we started chelating minerals correctly, we started getting good manganese uptakes into the plants.
this is a chart that uh, is a pretty scary chart. If you if you thought you were getting only thirty percent efficiency or fifty percent efficiency for every dollar you spent, you you wouldn't be very happy. In the case of boron and moly and whatever, two to three percent, five percent. Foliar sprays are a lot more efficient. That that is a, a just a general chart for gen looking at solid fertilizer applications. If you are using um, foliar sprays, the efficiency rate is a lot higher than that. Um, don't know the numbers. So we make um, chelated mineral foliar sprays to help the biology. Um, to fill in gaps where we don't have enough biology to, we're short of manganese availability. We're using foliar, chelated foliar mineral sprays to help fill the gaps in to help give nature a bit of a hand. We're not using big quantities. Um, it is impossible to explain how to make quality chelated mineral foliars in the 15 minutes of this talk. Um, I'd be kidding myself if I thought I could. But I would like to express that it is possible to make highly effective, highly uh, available chelates on farm very effectively price-wise. There's not a great deal of um, mystique about the whole process. First thing, number one, is water quality is critical. You've got to use enough uh, quality uh, water. You, secondly, you do a bucket test to check compatibility. Warm water aids solubility. And I'm going to show a solubility chart on the next chart, but we won't go there yet. We then check our pH. We're just the pH with citric acid. To chelate the minerals, we keep it under four and a half, 4.5 pH. We use lactobacillus that aids the chelation process. Uh, we add then add the minerals. We carefully add the minerals to the water rather than the other way around. We add ful fulvic acid powder, generally 120 to 150 grams per hectare type levels, and we leave it agitate for 24 hours. That seems to do the trick. We do get away with it less than that sometimes 12 hours just overnight but uh, generally try to leave it for 24 hours see on this chart this has just got a general analysis of most of the common minerals you use look at the solubility on the right hand side urea is highly soluble uh, calcium nitrate is basically very soluble but uh, something like soluble it's a, supposed to be a soluble boron, nine and a half kilos per hundred litres. So you've got to have enough liquid in your brew to be able to solubilize things. The warm water does help, but that gives you a bit of a, an indication of um, what it's doing. Now, in our process, we... Uh, Nicola, can you press the button to, you know, yeah. just to start that? Okay, that's that's our final vat where we combine everything. We use milk vats to chelate the chem the minerals. We generally keep boron separate to manganese, zinc, uh, potassium sulfate, cobalt. Um, so we normally have two or three small vats going with chelates. We have a a third vat going, which is our uh, compost extract. We use a com combination of wildland compost, high, that's very high quality humic compost. Uh, and we add to that worm castings um, from Nutrisoil. Just 
purely simply to add diversity to the mix. We also add a bit of Johnson Sioux. We add, add we're biodynamic organic. We add the BD preps. That white thing in behind the motor is the flow form. We do things with the water because our water is incredibly hard. Uh, on the hardness scale, it's around about 250. Um, so we're basically looking to um, improve the solubility. Anything over 70 halves the uptake in foliar sprays. So we're using the flow form to change and also magnets to change the structure of the water to make it uptake better. Oh. Righto, when we're doing foliar sprays, number one, common sense. It, just check the weather, just see what's going to happen in the next few hours, not too hot or windy or if the plants are stretched. Try to use 80 to 100 litres minimum. Uh, need good tank agitation so that things aren't, some of, some of the things, soluble in particular, can settle out. Some of the humates can settle out. We look to get try and get good leaf coverage, top and bottom. Polio treatments are highly effective, but may need to be, because you're only putting small quantities on, you may, may need to be done more regularly. Um, and that's the end. I might just very briefly say in our brews, we try to put uh, some biostimulants, which is the fish, kelp, sea minerals. We use humate in four weeks. We use the minerals that are shellated as we spoke of, speak of. Uh, we normally, we found that the shellation process is highly effective. So we're often putting not much more than uh, half a kilo or a kilo of um whether it be boron or uh, zinc sulfate, might be 50 grams of cobalt, might be 20 of uh, moly, if those are needed, as we see in SAP tests. We don't put any more than 0.7 or a kilo per hectare of copper because you can burn the leaves very easily. Last year we had a, in the stem elongation flag leaf stage, we had a, a drop off in potassium levels in our plants that dropped by a third over a three weeks period we identified in the sap test we did a spray with three and a half kilos of potassium sulfate lifted the the, the crop virtually changed color overnight it looked drought stricken yet it was raining at that point in time because the tomato weren't uh closing properly because of lack of potassium uh the water was transpiring faster than the crop could supply it from the roots. We put the, the foliar spray on with, with other things as well, all the biologicals, and that crop turned in colour almost overnight. And it's virtually saved the day and the levels went back up to the optimum range again. That's me, thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, we're going to hand it over to Dan now. I can't see anything, so I'm just seeing the screen. So, um, Dan, we're going to hand it over to you for question time. But one thing I just want to say before we pull it all together is that I've asked us three to come on um, together because it all complements each other. But you can see under the banner of all of us, we're working with natural intelligence farming methods. And um, that's not only about diversity. You can see diversity, but it's also... There's, there's a lot of complexity to work that to that it's about working with energy and working with yourself and and um, I guess the key to all of that is Jane Slattery so I do want to acknowledge Jane and her work in working with all of us and really helping us pull all this together so Dan I'll, I'll hand it over to you very good thanks to Carla um, some really interesting things come out of those those presentations I really enjoyed them um, great to see that you're integrating livestock with your, your own livestock, Nicola, um, yeah. integrating your four-legged harvesters there. Um, but very, very interesting to see you know, how long it's been since we've actually changed our, our native um, bio, soil biology with you know, modern farming methods you know, going back 60 years and, and not seeing, um, seeing certain species. It's, it's quite remarkable how much of an influence we've had on our, our environment for so long. 
um, and Cam, you know, hitting that the nail on the head about failure efficiency. Um, you know, it's as you said, you know, not being able to put or putting a lot of manganese on and not getting a result until you actually look at why you're not getting it, um, and then treating treating plants um, with that foliar program uh, just makes a lot of sense. You know, both you know in a crop nutrition, but um, but also for the back pocket. So. Um, three very, very interesting uh, presentations. So thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll get into question time now and we're, we're a bit short of um, of questions. So if anyone has had any questions through those three presentations, please throw them up in the question and answer um, section down the bottom. You'll find it down the bottom of your uh, your screen. So uh, but we'll make a start. Uh, we've got one here. Um, this is for you, Nicola. If you're buying these worm teas uh, and such, how is the bacteria still alive if it's been sitting in a drum on a shelf for a number of weeks? Yeah, so um, we have vented lids, um, so that helps with um, things coming, like the, um, the gases coming out. So microbes need to breathe. Uh, they need to um, also release their gases. Uh, so you'll find there's some air in all of our containers at the top and then um, we also feed humate so that they've got a food source so yes you do need to open to keep those microbes in really good condition you need to open the lid probably um, every three to four months and keep it out of the light um, other than that you know try and buy it within a, a 12 month period you can use it over two seasons um, but we really um, subsidised freight because um, of this reason and it moves around our worm farm all the time like it's constantly cycling so if you can get it fresh from us that's always best if it has stayed in your shed for a, a number of um, of weeks uh, sorry a number of, of months over you can actually add a food source to it so things go dormant but yes look it's still still a space we're looking at is how how long can it last um, but certainly looking after it um, with uh, open the lid and shutting in every couple of months and keeping it out of the light, it, it stays good for a, at least a season or two. Very good. Thanks, Nicola. Um, to yeah. you, Vic, um, have you found through your farm testing of Johnson Sue batches any batches that you wouldn't use? Um, we haven't actually. So we, we've tested um, and we're checking for that bacterial fungal ratio and making sure that we sort of hit a sweet spot where. Uh, with our Johnson Sue's, we are aiming for a more fungal um, compost and that just uh, complements everything else that we're using as well. Um, so, so we do do that microbiometer testing. Um, we haven't actually had one that has gone anaerobic, um, so we haven't, we haven't had the situation where we needed to sort of not include one, but I think if if your um, Johnson Sue is, is smelling beautiful, you know, earthy soil smell, um, you're pretty much on a winner. If it's gone anaerobic, you get that awful um, sort of rotten egg gas smell. Um, we haven't had one do it, but uh, if we did, we would probably not be using using that as a foliar. We might pop it back through one of the other compost systems to see if we can to rescue it um, a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, we haven't, haven't, but I would definitely be watching um, that it hasn't gone anaerobic. Another one for you, Beck. Um, just interested to know what course you did to identify your microbes and fungi with your microscope. Um, they're a, a West Australian um, group. They're called, I want to say Earthwile. Yeah, Earthwise. Earthwise, that's it. That's it with um, Ellen. Uh, it was, yeah, we did a, a course over a few weekends. Um, so it's quite intensive right from, you know, looking after your microscope, setting it up um, and then doing those qualitative um, samples. So... Yeah, I'm sure there's equivalent over there. Otherwise, maybe they could do some online. Ellen's wonderful. <laughs> ah, very good. Um, 
So Cam, you were talking about water quality. I mainly use Nutrisoil on my farm, but how would I go about testing my water to make sure it's okay? Uh, most of the soil testing labs will test water. Uh, Ag Beta will, uh, EAL will. That will give you a, a rundown and give you a hardness um, figure. Um, rainwater is best if you can organise it. Um, but yeah, just get get a test and then you know what's in it. If it's our our water's got high levels of calcium carbonates in it, so that is why it's so hard. Some of the water testing um, uh, structuring devices uh, certainly can help a great deal with that, and that's why we've been using the flow forms um, and also magnetic devices. The Hemi A P N devices I think are very good. There is a number of other things as well. I, I've got a question that has come through to me on a text um, from someone who can't uh, get in. How long can chelated minerals sit for? I have answered that they, they can sit for some months. And as Beck said, check the smell. If they smell off, they're off. Um, I'd reincorporate them back into something else or tip them out. But basically, they can sit around once they are chelated for quite a few months and quite okay. And the same goes for compost extract. Also, in my opinion, I've seen it sit around for quite a few months. I've had a couple of batches go off, just sitting in an open vat. Um, it smells off, throw it out. It's not an expensive thing. Thank you. Um... One here, I think for everyone, um, I've been told that pig manure is best for composting due to the monogastric system and nutrient retention, but most people use ruminant manure. Is there any thoughts or comments on, on this at all? Um, well, I can, uh, we're using our sheep manure because one, it's available, um, it's sitting under our shed, but uh, the other thing is that because Diane and Ian have been, you know, working on the the um, epigenetics of their animals for so long, for us, it's a really good quality product, um, and it works really, really well in our context. So we have had a few um, batches of um, solid compost come through, um, and we've had a, a pile that does smell like pig manure. Um, so really, I just feel bad for Tanya who mixes up our extract because it doesn't smell nice. <laughs> it's definitely got piggy undertones. <laughs> but uh, at quality wise, um, it's a beautiful compost that we get in from them, but uh, we're very, very happy with the results we get with our sheep manure because of that epigenetic value um, that our sheep have. Dan, um, to help that person, if there's lots of literature on using pig manure in vermicast, I, I don't actually, I can't recall the um, results, but if they Google pig manure and vermicast, it gives lots of results about using it and, and the benefits of it. It comes back to diversity, diversity, diversity again too. Absolutely. Uh, for you, Beck, uh, what ratios of raw materials are you using in your, in your Johnson suit? Oh, I've got this written down. Um, so, so we're making it in bulk. We're making about 30 at a time. So um, we, we're sort of heading towards the standard um, carbon ratio that um, is recommended by um, Dr. David Johnson. Um, that's not coming into my head right now, but um, if yeah, if you look if you look up those uh, compost carbon to nitrogen ratios, so um, so we our carbon source we're using is our multi-species hay, um, and our nitrogen source is the is the sheep manure. So um, I yeah, I would definitely stick to stick to those recommended ratios. 30 to 1 comes to mind, nitrogen to the carbon. Yeah, I, it's just not coming into my head. Maybe it's because it's early. I've only had one coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
I think fungal um, seed and ratio is sort of roughly that 24 to 1. Um, so, yeah, it's probably aiming for something like that, I'm guessing. So, um, Cam, one for you. How does lacto help with chelation? I, I don't really know. It is certainly very low in pH. Its uh, pH is about a good lacto brew is about 3.5 3 pH. Mm. Certainly helps from that point of view. Um, the biology we think helps with um, making the uh, uh, making the manganese more available, or making the minerals more available. But uh, don't really know. But we do know it works. I've tested. Um, Lacto against um, amino acid chelation, and we got a better uptake of manganese into the plants from lacto than we did from the amino acid chelation. So uh, in this biological area, there's a whole lot of unknowns. You know, as um, Nicola was showing, 42% of the, of the biology in there um, Vermi wash is uh, unknown origin. That's there's a lot of unknowns in this biological area, but uh, it, you find something that works and you use it and do it. So Absolutely. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. <laughs> no, I, I think you've hit the nail on that. It's you know going into this sort of method of farming, we need to be the observationalists. Um, we need to observe what what does work on our farm and what doesn't, because we we don't know a lot of the science behind what is happening so um yeah if we we observe something on our farm that is working and that's um yeah that is still evidence of it uh, scientific evidence that it is working so um so yeah i have run out of questions here and we are at the top of the hour so i'd like to thank everyone uh oh, one last one um is adding zinc and manganese to our bio tea or extract going to damage the biology uh, I'll just jump in on there. It's got a buffering capacity. So we've done testing of when you add nutrients mm -hmm. to biology. Um, within 16 hours, the biology is pretty dead. Uh, so you don't leave it tank mixed. Basically, uh, just add it and, and go is, is going to be the best way to keep it alive. Uh, I'll come into that one as well, Nicola. I agree with that. Uh, we, we run... Bats for our chelation, and we combine them. That little video that was shown of our mixing bat, that's our final mixing bat. So, we uh, in the while the spray rig is away spraying, we can com someone combines the uh, the two or three different sources of minerals with the extract and uh, other biostimulants we put in fish and kelp and sea minerals and sometimes seawater. We combine them in, in that final mixing vat and put them over the flow form that helps the energizing and aerating. And then it goes into the spray rig and goes out. So it's they are combined at a fairly short time. But it also depends on the quantity of uh, minerals you put in. If you're putting a kilo or, or, or maybe a couple of kilos per hectare, that is acceptable, especially if it's... Um, Chelated with uh, with a carbon source like fulvic, that certainly helps to buffer and uh, um, do the damage. But if you're putting trying to put five or ten kilos of copper sulfate out, you're definitely going to kill everything or zinc sulfate or something like that. So I'd just be very careful at the rates you put in with biological product products. Thank you. Now, dose does make the poison. So. Um, right, we'll uh, we'll call it up there. Thank you very much um, to Nutrisoil um, for your support for Vic No Till and for uh, for putting organising this webinar. It's been very very interesting. Um, to our speakers today, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, it was fantastic to to hear uh, what you you guys had to had to present on. Um, and thank you very much to everyone that has registered and, and come along today to to today's webinar. Um, we are hoping that we can get a few more done before the end of the year, but um, but yeah, thank you very much for your your attendance today. So uh, 
Is there anything you'd like to add, Michaela, before we, we wrap up? No, uh, just that we'll send out the slides and a couple of documents, especially the DNA and Cam's do a document that might be helpful as well to remember all the things that he went through. No, very good. All righty. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, hope to see you at the next one. Thank Thanks, you all. Dan. Thanks, Amy. Thanks.